I got to tell you a personal story. 3.30 in the morning on uh, Tuesday, we receive a phone call. We live out in Corbett. And so we're, we're awoke there at 3.30 in the morning. I don't know about you, but at 3.30, that's night-night time for me. And we get this phone call, and we're informed uh, that the uh, forest fire in the gorge is spreading. It's moving east. We are at level two evacuation notice. Now, I've never had anybody call me and tell me I'm at level two evacuation notice. I didn't know what it meant, but it wasn't enough to get me out of bed. But my wife's up, man. She's just buzzing around, and she's looking out the door trying to see, well, what's, you know, the smoke is thick, and what's going on out there? And she buzzes back in, and she comes back in and says a couple things to me, and then she's just buzzing around the house. What should we do? Should we get some things together? It's like, I don't know, because it's not time for me to get up yet. Uh, After a few more moments of that, it was pretty clear. We weren't going back to sleep, and so we get up. Now, I've got the best neighbors around. My in-laws are my neighbors. How many of you would love to live next door to your mother-in-law? So my in-laws, they're up doing the same thing. You know, nobody's too worked up, but we figure, well, we don't know. Where where is this fire? Is it it just down the street? Is it? I have no idea. And so we're all kind of doing the same thing, pulling a few, you know, essential paperwork together. You know, maybe grabbing some photo albums, some things that you felt like, well, these are irreplaceable things. You know, we can replace a kitchen table and a couch. Forget those. And so we pack up a few of the irreplaceables, and, you know, we get those to the car. And then my mother-in-law, and, of course, I'm a, or, yeah, and her insurance papers, right. Make sure you have those. And I'm a little perturbed because it's bedtime, man. <laughs> and... Uh, my mother-in-law, she said something. She said, well, you know, I'd, I, I'd rather, you know, be kind of taking precautions and then find out that it wasn't necessary, find out it was a false alarm, rather than all of a sudden don't act on this phone call and then find out it's too late and then you lose everything. How many of you think that sounds like a pretty wise person right there? I'd rather take the precautions and then find out it was a false alarm. You know, at any time, the Bible tells us that Jesus is ready to part the clouds, man. And he's ready to come. And he's ready to rapture his church. But rather than folks getting ready, they're kind of spiritually just like I was that morning. Uh, I don't know that he's really coming. I don't know that it's really going to be that soon. And so they kind of just hit their spiritual uh, snooze button and kind of go back to sleep. How many of you know what I'm talking about right there? We got to remember, you, you know, uh, we all want to know when he's coming back, right? Wouldn't you like to be able to put it on your calendar? Set the date, set the time, and uh, you just kind of know. You know, throughout years, and if you've been around the church for any length of time, you know there's, all, you know, there's always somebody that comes down the pike that somehow they've, they've cracked the Bible's secret code and they know exactly when he's coming back. And they write a book and they put it out there and a bunch of people buy in to know it. Well, he's coming back on this date of this year and so I'm going to take my lawn chair I'm going to go out in the field somewhere and beam me up Jesus. I'm so ready. Uh, The Bible tells us this. I mean, if you ever hear anybody talking like that, when you see the book coming down the pike when they got it figured out, don't buy the book. Don't buy. This is what the real book says. It says, nobody knows the day or the hour. Would you say that with me? No one knows about the day or the hour. So we don't know that. And then it goes on and it says, it'll be like it was in the days of uh, Noah. He goes on, he says, it'll be like this. Two men will be in a field. One will be taken and the other one left. Two women will be grinding wheat, uh, grinding at the hand mill. One will be taken, the other one left. Listen, we don't know the exact time that he's coming back, but we can know that it's getting close. Jesus was talking to his disciples about his second coming, and they wanted to know, when are you coming? 
how will we know when it's time for you to come? And Jesus talks to him, and he says this. He says, well, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars or revolutions, don't be frightened. He says, nation will rise up against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and famines, pestilence in various places, fearful events, great signs in the heavens and on earth. Can I just tell you there's always been horrific events that hit planet earth? They're, they've always been there. That's not new. But I think if you've been around any length of time, you would say, my goodness, the frequency and the intensity is certainly eye-catching. It's attention-getting. I mean, you would hear of an earthquake, and it would be catastrophic and the world would respond to that earthquake. But you usually don't end up with a couple of uh, hurricanes, an earthquake, five states on fire. You know, all of it happened in the same week, for Pete's sake. And just before the one, uh, was it Harvey? Just before uh, Harvey had hit Texas, just before that, I mean, they had experienced uh, the record rainfall ever recorded, 40-some-odd inches, right? 45 inches. We can never complain about our rain, right? Uh, you got North Korea. I mean, they're pushing us towards World War III. Harvey, Irma, and right behind Irma, gee, there's two other hurricanes coming down the pike. You've got Oregon, Washington, Montana, California being uh, ravaged by uh, wildfires. You've got an 8.1 earthquake hitting Mexico. Listen, I can just tell you this. These natural catastrophes, they're not new. They're not new. But the fact is, there's, there seems to be greater frequency. There seems to be greater magnitude. Now, we may end up in a lull, but you, it won't be very long before all of a sudden the, ner the, you know, the news is reporting largest hurricane ever reported to hit landfall. It's like, well, didn't we just have that last year? Record rainfall, didn't we just have that two years ago somewhere else? And it's like the frequency. And so you start to read that in the last days, you know, these kind, you know, the, the whole earth is groaning and awaiting for his return. And now that's either going to excite you or that's going to freak you out a little bit. It's like the woman uh, who's ready to give birth. She don't know the exact, uh, you know, minute. She doesn't know the exact second that that baby's coming, but she knows she can feel the birthing pain. She knows by the signs it's getting close. We better get to the doctor. Right, honey? You remember that day? Right? I was out on a bike ride. You better get here. <laughs> it's about time. And uh, we don't know the exact second. We don't know the exact date. We don't know the exact year. But we can tell by the signs of the time that it's getting close to his return. How many of you think we're getting close to his return? Now, it could be today. It could be tomorrow. It may not be in our lifetime. But when you're looking, you know, in God's book, it says a day is like a thousand years. So it might be just outside your lifetime, but that's still close when you're taking a look at the scope of eternity. Are you with me? These are the signs of the time. Paul wrote about this. He said, there will be terrible times in the last days. Would you read that with me? There will be terrible times in the last days. How many of you have experienced some terrible things in your life? You've experienced some terrible things. I would say this eight-point earthquake, that's a terrible thing. Irma, that's a terrible thing. These fires, that's a terrible thing. These are terrible things. Now, they're not new, but we've been in the last days. But listen, God has not left us unprepared. I love what Jesus says. Man, would you guys want to read, read this one with me, everyone? It says, I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. Hallelujah. God is raising up his church to be a beacon of light, a beacon of hope. Why the world is just spinning out of control, there needs to be somebody some people, some body of believers that step up and say, point the way. My redemption draweth nigh. We point the way to Jesus Christ. 
Listen to what, what Paul said about the last days. He said, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Listen, it may be tough times, but he's not left us unresourced, unprepared. He's not abandoned us like we're orphans having to fend for, him, for ourselves. But he has poured out his spirit on us. So whatever's coming down the pike, we can get through that because he's given us the promise that he's raising us up and he's filling us with his spirit. Amen. Let's give the Lord applause for that one. So I don't know about you, but these are exciting times to be alive. Can anybody say amen to that? These are exciting times. Go ahead and grab your outline, and I w I'd like you to fill out, fill, fill in a couple of the blanks there. Jesus is coming for his church. Who is his church? Why don't you turn to the person next to you and say, you're his church. You're the dwelling place of his spirit. Now, we should be very excited for his return. Amen? Are you? We should be. Thessalonians says this, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God. Read the underline with me. The dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive. Uh, would you read it with me? After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Now, this verse talks to us about two very exciting promises. One is the, re the resurrection of the dead. What's that? Listen, all those folks that have died but knew Christ, there's a promise here that talks about a literal bod a bodily resurrection. Wow, that's incredible. And then I'm hoping for the second one here, where it says that we who are alive and remain, we call it the rapture. That's when the, the church is caught up to meet the Lord. That's an exciting promise, amen? Now, I got I to gotta be honest with you. I grew up in church, and as a kid, I got in trouble often. I know you can't imagine that, but I, I was a little bit squirrely. And it, Steve, do you remember this? This was the time when they had all those movies. What were some of the names, okay? The Thief in the Night. The Distant Thunder. What's another one? These, these were all movies about about, you know, the rapture and getting left behind and this. I'm telling you what, man, when you're a little kid watching this stuff, it is terrifying. Not to mention, I got in trouble. And I remember coming home one day, and there ain't nobody home. I'm like, ah! <laughs> They've all been raptured! Which, by the way, I know my brothers pretty well. I'm not sure what would have made me think they got raptured and I didn't. But uh, I was terrified. I was terrified of that thought of being raptured and being left behind. Uh, but did you know he doesn't want you to be afraid? He doesn't want you to be fearful. He wants you to be excited. And I've shared this story with you before, but it sure makes a good point. Now, when I was a kid... Uh, you know, I just re I truly just love my dad. And uh, back in those days, you didn't play video games, right? What'd you do after school? Yeah, you went outside, you rode your bicycle, you threw the football around, then it was the Frisbee, then it was the baseball. And so we were out there all afternoon, and about evening time, sometime just before dinner, I would anticipate looking down the street, and I would see my dad's car turn the corner of, Southeast 115th, and I could see him coming down the road. And man, I was excited. I was excited he'd get out of the car, and I was there to give my dad a hug. And boy, what a great time, what a great memory. But I do remember there was one day I was not excited for his return at all. Uh, earlier that day, my brother Gene, who's just a couple of years older than I, we found a couple cigarettes. So we thought, let's go smoke these. So we went down. Uh, we went down to our fort, which is you know down this old bumpy dead end road, 
And out in the field, there's a tree, and we had a tree fort there. And so we just lit up, and man, were we cool. <laughs> and out of nowhere, my brother Rick, he's nine years older than me. You remember this, Rick? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I don't even know how he got to the tree. All of a sudden, poof, he pops out. What are you guys doing? <laughs> We're doing nothing. Nothing. Why are you guys smoking? We said, you're not going to tell on us, are you? Nah, of course not. You're going to have to tell on yourself. <laughs> what? I got to tell you, that was the longest day of my life. I mean, that particular day, I wasn't out throwing the football. That day, I wasn't looking for him to round that corner. That day, I wasn't outside the car door ready to give him a hug. And in fact, when he came walking through the door, I was just sitting there on that chair with that sheepish look on my face and just hoping when I stood up, he wouldn't notice all the padding I'd stuffed down the back of my pants. <laughs> just in case he got a little bit wild with his belt that day. That was a long day. <clears throat> I got to tell you, Jesus is coming back. I hope you're longing for his return. I hope you're excited about his return. That there's a joyful anticipation that he's going to round the corner, he's going to part the clouds, and you're going to meet him eye to eye. And he's going to call you up. But if you're kind of over here doing your thing, you may not be that excited about that day. This is a great opportunity to just kind of settle things. It just took a moment to stand and say to my dad, Dad, we were smoking today. He kind of had that perplexed look like, you told me? <laughs> he made us. <laughs> he was so gracious and so kind. And you know, you have a father who's so gracious and so kind. He forgives you, man. He doesn't want you living in fear. He doesn't want you hiding, wondering, is he coming? I don't know, man. I'm not ready. He wants his church to be ready, right? Amen. Let's give the Lord an applause for that. Now, can I just tell you this? You're not going to get there on somebody else's coattails. You're not going to get there on somebody else's spirituality. You're not going to get there on somebody else's salvation. It's not like, man, if I just, if I just hold on to Sherry and she gets beamed up, I'm going to go with her. <laughs> Doesn't work that way. Doesn't work that way. It says this. Well, let me tell you this. God, God does not have any grandchildren, only children. Only his children, okay? So just because your parent is a believer doesn't mean you get to go. Just because your grandpa planted a church doesn't mean you get to go. The reason you get to go is because you've said yes to him. You've said yes to a personal relationship. You know, the Bible talks a lot about ensuring yourself for the certainty of meeting him face to face. And one of his best parables is in Matthew. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like ten virgins who took their lamps and they went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but not, did not take any oil with them. Now, the bridegroom, he was a long time in coming. Uh, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, they woke up and, uh, <clears throat> oh, the cry rang out. Here's the bridegroom. Come out and meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and they trimmed their lamps. Read verse 8 with me. The foolish one said to the wise, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. Verse 10. The virgins who were ready went out to meet him to the wedding banquet and the door was shut. Later, the other ones also came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth. Read it with me. I don't know you. Verse 13, therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or 
the hour. Now, in Scripture, oil has always been a, uh, a picture of the Holy Spirit. It's a picture of the Holy Spirit. And the idea of, give me some of your oil, that doesn't work. I don't get the Holy Spirit from Sherry. I don't get the Holy Spirit from Roger. I can only get that from him. So it's not me going through you going to him. It's me going to him. Are you guys with me? We got to go directly to the source. In Romans, it says this. Would you read it with me? If anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. Listen, your relationship with him is the most important detail of your life. Doesn't it make sense that you would tend to the most important details? You take care of the details of getting ready for a vacation. You take care of the details of doing this or doing that. And so often, you know, people take care of the details of earning lots of money, acquiring things, doing, you know, extravagant things with their lives. They take care of these other details. They work hard with these other things. They work towards success. Without ever giving any serious thought to where they're going to spend eternity. You know, no one's going to be able to stand before the throne of God on their day and say, it, it really wasn't my fault. My parents didn't take me to church. The, the pastor put me to sleep. I didn't hear what he was talking about. It was too boring. I fell asleep during church. Those type of excuses aren't going to work. Too many hypocrites. Listen, you're responsible for you and your relationship with God. Are you guys with me? It's a personal thing. Now, there really is such a thing as too late. We talk about how God is the God of second chances, which is so true. And it's even better than that. He's the third chance and fourth chance and fifth chance, and it goes on and on and on. God is the God of second chances and beyond. And the good news is God, will, God is here today. And God will be here tomorrow. But you may not be here tomorrow. And when tomorrow comes, if you've not taken care of that most important detail of your life, then for you, it is too late. That's why the Bible says today's the day. Today is the day of your salvation. And I think it's important that if you're not excited for his return, it's important that you allow the Holy Spirit to search you and begin to answer the question, why am I not? Perhaps it's because I don't understand. Perhaps it's because I've not been taught. Perhaps it's because I've never settled my own personal relationship with him. Well, then today's your day. You've come on a fantastic day. Amen? <clears throat> so how do I do that? Well, let's put that next point up there. It says, believe him. Would you say that with me? Believing is the key to receiving. Believing is the key to receiving the promise of eternity. Would you read Ephesians 1.13 with me? Having believed. Say that with me. Having believed, you are marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. If you've never given your life to Christ, today's your day. Today's your chance to take care of the most important detail. Life is a process of taking care of details. How about you take care of the most important detail, where you're going to spend eternity? This is your opportunity. This is your chance to take personal responsibility for your life and your relationship with God. You can't run around saying, give me what you got. Give me what you got. There's only one person we can go to, and that's him, and he will give you what he's got. Amen? And that's the indwelling presence of his Holy Spirit. Today is an opportunity for you to allow the oil of his Spirit to enter your life, to fill you. We don't like to talk about this, but there truly is a thing as 
too late. Now, you're here right now, so it's not too late. That's good news. But you don't have a guarantee of tomorrow. And by the way, why would we want to hesitate on the most glorious, joy-filled opportunity offered to mankind? Why would we want to put that off for another day? That we could walk in harmony and relationship and celebration with the God who created us. If we can finally identify and recognize the purpose for which you are here. Your purpose isn't just so that you can get up every morning, go to work, hopefully earn enough money so you can retire someday and then spend the last of your miserable days rocking in a rocking chair until you drop dead with a cup of sweet tea. Okay? <laughs> your purpose is a whole lot more than that. Amen? You're from the South, so you're going, it sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> Why would we want to hesitate one single minute? I've said it before, my only regret about Marion Kelly is that I didn't do it one day sooner. I, I'm going to ask if we could bow our heads together for a moment. And I want to give you an opportunity to enter into the most joyous relationship you could ever have. And that's a relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It's for why you were put on this earth, to have relationship with God. And he wanted relationship with you so bad that he spared no expense, but he gave his son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross so that you could have a relationship with him. And so if that's you... Today's your day to take care of the most important detail, knowing where you will spend eternity, because I've got exciting news. Jesus Christ is coming back for his church. You certainly do not want to be left behind for that. Amen. So I'm going to ask you, if you need to give your life to Christ right now, if you need to recommit your life to him, you were, you were like me, man, and you were off getting in trouble. And it was your time to come before the Father and say, this is what I did, and I'm so sorry. And let his grace flow over you again. If it's time for you to commit or recommit, would you throw your hand in the air where you're at? Raise it up high if that's you. Raise them up. I see your hand and yours. And I see yours, 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 yours. Anybody else today? And I see yours in the back and yours right there. And I see yours right here. Hallelujah. And here's the good news. If I missed your hand, he certainly didn't. Amen. Let's pray this prayer together. Dear Lord, I confess I have fallen short. And I need forgiveness. I need salvation. I need a fresh start. Come into my life. Fill me with the oil of your spirit. I can't borrow that. I can only receive it from you. He who has the Son has life. Lord, write my name in the book. Put my name on the roll. And I'm going to stand on the rock that ain't going anywhere. I'm living for you. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen.